This is a video lesson on NMR by Dr Joanna Horton of Barton Peveril College. It is based largely on the OCRB Salter's syllabus for A2. This is a video lesson on NMR, Nuclear Magnetic Resonance, largely targeted at OCRB Salter's Chemistry syllabus for A level. However, it is relevant as an introduction to basic proton NMR for everyone. NMR, or nuclear magnetic resonance, is based on the fact that all nuclei have a property called spin. This means there is a moving charge, which, if you know your physics, means you must have a little magnetic field for each nucleus. While all nuclei have spin, the ones that have spin a half are the most useful, as they can easily be detected and their magnetism investigated easily. Deuterium, or 2 hydrogen, has spin 1, so is not detected using this method. It does not show up on the spectra. This means deuterated solvents can be used in NMR. If a nucleus is put in a strong magnetic field, it can align itself with the magnetic field. This is very much like a compass point pointing to north on the Earth as it is a small magnet aligning itself with a much larger magnetic field around it, so pointing in the same direction. If a pulse of energy is applied at just the right frequency, the nucleus can absorb this energy and flip up, so pointing in the opposite direction. This is called excitation. We use radio frequency radiation to do this. However, this is unstable, so the nuclei are pushed back by the magnetic field and flip. And when they do this, they emit a small pulse of energy. We can detect and measure this energy, um, and it is different for each chemically different nucleus. This process is called relaxation. Electrons orbiting the nucleus will also generate a small magnetic field, opposing the one applied. This would effectively reduce the strength of the magnetic field felt by the nucleus, causing the energy pulse given off during relaxation also to be slightly less. This is called a chemical shift because it is caused by the chemical environment around the nucleus. This means that each nucleus surrounded by the exact same electron density will have an identical chemical shift. If the nucleus is in a slightly different chemical environment, then the chemical shift will be slightly different. This means we can count the number of different chemical environments within a molecule. For example, we can look at ethanol. We've got CH3, CH2 and OH you should be able to see that each of the protons in the CH3 are the same. We've labelled them in blue here. Then, and they're all the same because they're all attached to the same carbon atom, then the CH2 next to it should be different to the CH3 because that carbon is next to an oxygen and the other one wasn't. Then, at last, the proton attached to the oxygen will be very different, as oxygen is much more electronegative. And this should give us three different peaks. And we can use a data sheet to look up the range where you should be able to find the peak. Chemical shift itself is measured in delta, or parts per million, ppm. This is the NMR data table from the Salter's chemistry data sheet. However, if you have a different syllabus, you should use a different sheet, the one that your exam board gives out. We can use it to work out the chemical shift for each peak. The CH3 should be in the range 0.7 to 1.6 ppm. The CH2 is next to an electronegative oxygen atom, so has less electron density around it. This gives a possible shift in the range delta equals 3.3 to 4.8 parts per million. The last proton on the oxygen atom can be anywhere within quite a wide range, 0.5 to 4.5 ppm. This large range is due to the extent of hydrogen bonding, which can be small or large. 
OH peaks are also quite broad sometimes due to this effect. So, we can look at an NMR spectrum and assign peaks using the data we've just looked up. The CH3 in blue is at the lowest ppm, approximately 1.2, I would say. The CH2 is the peak at the highest ppm, and it's in the lighter colour blue there, at about 3.7. The OH peak is a little broader and is found at about 2.6 you will see that two of these peaks are split into smaller peaks, though the OH is not. So, the information that we can get from this spectrum can tell us the chemical shift, so the possible chemical environment of the protons in that peak. It can also tell us the number of different peaks, so therefore the number of different chemical environments. However, there is more. We saw that two of the peaks in the spectrum previously were not single peaks but had been split. And this is high resolution NMR. This is caused by the protons that are attached to the carbon next door. And they can affect the magnetic field felt by those hydrogen atoms. If the neighbouring hydrogen is aligned with the magnetic field, it strengthens that field a tiny amount. If it is against, it will weaken the magnetic field by the same amount. So there are two possible shifts the proton can have, one slightly higher and one slightly lower than the average. This gives us a doublet where one peak is split into two peaks. So if there is only one proton on the carbon next door, then there are two ways for the resonance to be affected, up or down. Both these little peaks will be the same size, as there is the same probability that the proton next door will be with or against the magnetic field. If there are two protons next door, however, then there are four possible ways for these protons to be. They can both point with, they, one can point against and one with, and of course the other way around, so there are two ways for one to be with and one against and they can both point against the magnetic field. So, when they are both, both with, it is pushed up. When they are both against, they are pushed down. With one up and one down, you actually don't get any shift at all because one will push and one will pull and the effect will cancel itself out. This will give us what we call a triplet. Three peaks in the ratio one to 2 to 1. We can then derive what we call the n plus 1 rule from this. If there are n protons next door, then the peak will be split into n plus 1 little peaks. So, if there are 3 next door, again there is only one way that they can all be opposed. There are 3 different ways in which they can be 2 against and 1 with and three more different ways, one can be against and two with. And then one way only that all three can be with the magnetic field. And this gives us four peaks in the ratio one to three to three to one. And we call this a quartet. So the n plus one rule says that if you have n protons next door, you will also have n plus one peaks. This is called the multiplicity of the peak. Integration of the peak will also tell you the area under the peak, which is proportional to the number of electrons in that same chemical environment. So, in summary, the spectrum can tell us the ppm or delta range, giving us the chemical environment of the proton using a data sheet, the number of peaks, so number of different chemical environments, the multiplicity or splitting, which gives us the number of protons next door, and the area under the peak, so the number of protons in that same chemical environment. So, a question. A compound with the formula C3H8O has the following NMR spectrum. What is its structure? 
I suggest you pause this or stop going through the slides and attempt the question on your own first before continuing. OK, so to start, how to answer this, the best way is to think what possible structures you could have. I can only think of three possible structures for this, propan-1-ol, propan-2-ol and the ether methoxethane. First, we can look at what propan-1-ol ought to give us. First, you can see four different chemical environments, so that should give us four different peaks. The first is due to the CH3, and that is shown in green. This has the delta range 0.7 to 1.6, that is just CH3 attached to a carbon. This peak should also be a triplet, as there are two protons next door. The next peak should be for the CH2 in yellow, in the same range, 0.7 to 1.6. But this time, as there are five protons next door, that is, three from the CH3 on one side and two from the CH2 on the other, it will appear as a multiplet with six peaks, following the n plus one rule. Then the CH2 next to the O, which is in orange here, will be in the range 3.3 to 4.8, as it is next to the oxygen. It should also be a triplet, because there are two protons next door. OH protons do not cause splitting, so we don't need to count that proton for the n plus 1 rule. And that peak should be in orange. So the OH peak should be a singlet, and it could be anywhere in the range 0.5 to 4.5 parts per million. And these are not affected by splitting, as we said before, due to hydrogen bonding. So will always occur as a singlet. Looking at propan-2-ol, we should only have three peaks this time, as both the CH3s are identical. Both are attached to the same carbon. Their peak should be in the range 0.7 to 1.6, as they are both just CH3 attached to a carbon. And they are shown in green on this diagram should be a doublet and that's because there is on the carbon next door only one proton and n plus one equals two. The CH proton itself however which is shown in yellow here is next to six different protons so it would be a multiplet with seven peaks using the n plus one rule. We call this a heptet. Lastly the OH proton here shown in orange would be a singlet, as all OH protons are, and it should be in the range 0.5 to 4.5 parts per million. The last possibility is methyl ethyl ether, also called methoxethane, which also has three different chemical environments. One CH3, here shown in green, in the range delta equals 0.7 to 1.6, this should be a triplet, as there are two protons next door. Then the next peak should be the CH2, which we've shown here in yellow, next to the oxygen atom. So it should be in the range 3.3 to 4.8. It is next to CH3, so 3 plus 1 is 4. It should be a quartet. The last peak should be the CH3 here shown in orange, which is also next to the oxygen atom and should be in that same range, 3.3 to 4.8 parts per million. It should also be a singlet, as there are no protons next door. So, to answer the question, we can see that there are only three different peaks in the spectrum, which means only three different chemical environments. This means it can't be propan one ol because there were four different chemical environments than that, so we should be seeing four peaks. There is only one multiplet, no quartet, which means it cannot be the methoxethane ether. <clears throat> this leaves only propan-2-ol, and we can assign those peaks to propan-2-ol. 
So there's a big doublet at delta equals 1.2. This is the CH3 groups, which we've shown in green. The multiplet at 4.0 is the CH proton, here shown in yellow. So the singlet at 2.2 must be the OH proton, here shown in orange. In summary, we use chemical shift, or delta in parts per million, to give us a possible chemical environment. The number of peaks gives us the number of different chemical environments. The multiplicity, or splitting, gives us the number of protons next door. And the area under the peak, if you are given the area under the peak, gives us the number of protons in that chemical environment.